Good evening. I'm Carla Hayden, the Librarian of Congress, and I'm here with Frederick J. Ryan, the publisher and CEO of the Washington Post. Fred is also the chairman of the board of directors of the White House Historical Association, the publisher of his new book, and one of my favorites now, Wine and the White House, a history. Because many of you know that during the pandemic, many of us found new passions and we deepened our current skills and sharpened them, and especially around food. And we began exploring new wines to complement meals. And I hope that this conversation will inspire our audience to think of using wine in new ways, not just to accompany food, but also to have it as a way to bring people together and even smooth over some edges in your own life. So Fred, your book, and as I said, one of my new favorites because it is such a beautiful book, goes a long way to help us doing that. Thinking about wine and using wine as an accompaniment to all types of things, even diplomacy. So I have to ask you, uh, what what's some of the background on your book and what inspired you? And thank you so much for using the Library of Congress for some of your research too. Well, thank you, Carla. Thank you. Uh, with, with over 40 million books in the Library of Congress, I am so honored that you'd spend a few minutes to talk about this book on wine. Uh, and the library was a tremendous uh, partner and tremendous asset in gathering material for this. So I'm very grateful to you and your team. Uh, the kind of the, the background on it is that, it, well, first, as, a, the, as an author, how often do you get to write a book about something you're passionate about, and particularly the intersection of two things, of presidential history and wine, and that was a unique opportunity. Uh, but what led to it is, is uh, you and I both serve on the White House Historical Association, which has published many books, uh, and there have been others who have published books, of course, about every president. There have been books about uh, music in the White House, about the furniture in the White House, the art in the White House the architecture in the White House, pets in the White House, but there'd never been a book about wine in the White House. So we thought that would be something worth exploring. And I just found, um, as I'm sure you have in, in your publishing over the years, that you get into something and it, it just gets deeper and deeper. Since there hadn't been an, a book in the past on this subject, this kind of became a chance to do something that's uh, somewhat definitive for a while. So it, uh, it became more and more extensive. I found more and more things I thought might interest readers. So uh, in the end, it, uh, it's quite extensive and it weighs five pounds. So while you're drinking wine with one hand, you can do bicep curls with the other. Well, it's it's certainly something that you want to have in your home. And you also tell in this, it's got such great stories and, and all types of things. But there's a story, it's pretty funny, I think, about how you first got interested in wine. So could you share that with us? Because let's just share that. <laughs> well... Thanks for embarrassing me right out of the start. Uh, right. Carla. Come on. Come on. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I did mention the story in the book. It started, I, I went to college in Los Angeles at, at USC and I was trying to impress a first date. So I, I went to great lengths to find out what the restaurant was that celebrities went to. And I found this restaurant called the Brown Derby. I'd seen it in movies and, and movie stars once went there. Uh, by the time this date I was trying to impress and I got there, we found out that they didn't go there anymore, but that was beside the point. But I was in this restaurant, I was trying to impress her and we ordered prime rib, uh, which was their specialty. And then the waiter came over with the wine list and he put it in front of me and I didn't speak any French. And all I saw was a lot of really long words with a lot of uh, French uh, spellings. And I didn't know what to do. So I went down the list and I found the shortest one I could find that I thought I could say. It was called Chateau Arch. A-R-C-H-E. And I said, we'll have the Chateau Arch. And the waiter said, are you sure you like that with your prime rib? And I was trying to impress her. And I said, yes, I have it all the time. Whenever I have prime rib, I always have Chateau Arch. This is what I like. So he said, okay. And we go through dinner, they bring the prime rib and then they bring over the, the wine and the guy opens it. And it's this little chilled bottle of white dessert wine that you would have with <laughs> pastries or pudding or sweets or something. It's the last wine in the world you would have with prime rib. So after being humiliated, and that was the first and last date there, uh, I decided I should probably try to learn a little bit more about wine. Well, you clearly have gone on since then, and we're going <laughs> to tell the date. 
<laughs> but <laughs> I've gone on to learn so much more about wine. And so was that something that spurred you? But how did that happen where you really got oh, serious about it? Well, I did. I thought I, I wanted to know. I was curious and I didn't want to be embarrassed again. So I took a few courses like most colleges have. And then I went to a few classes at, 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 uh, at other programs that were offered in, in Los Angeles. And then I found that one of the best ways to really learn about wine is to go to the wine region. So I went to Napa Valley, spent some time there. And then I was fortunate over the years to be able to visit some of the other wine regions of the world in France and Spain and uh, in Italy. And uh, just through the course of it, I, I learned a lot. I found, by the way, the, my best recommendation for learning a lot about wine is to taste it and drink it. But uh, I made sure I did that for that too. But that kind of led me to have an interest in wine and, of course, have an interest in the... I, I studied politics in college with an interest in the president. So that was this intersection that led to the book coming together. And it does bring it together because you learn a lot in the book about uh, the history of the country, but also the history of the country in terms of how hospitality uh, and having the White House, and this is the place that you greet, and becoming a, a cultured uh, country, and wine was about that. And according to your book, when we first started out in America during the American Revolution, the most popular wine was Madeira? Yes. Uh, and. And that's one thing, by the way, uh, as you mentioned, Carla, that, that really kind of captured me on this book is how much wine has played a role in our country from the earliest days, even the Continental Congress. I was finding letters from those of the Continental Congress talking about how hard they were working during the day to design our country. And then at night they were sitting down and enjoying wine. And then uh, with George Washington and, and um, even before he was president, I, I found records of when he was a uh, general preparing for battle, he had wine delivered to his, his tops, uh, the leaders of, of the various divisions so they could strategize on what battle was going to be. And the wine, as you mentioned, that was drank at that time was Madeira. And mm -hmm. Madeira wine, it's made in a little island, uh, as you may know, off the coast of Africa. And it's a very, uh, the reason it was so popular in the United States at that time, it's a very sturdy wine. It could be put in barrels and put in the the hull of a ship and it could take the rough seas, it could take the heat, the cold, nothing would cause the wine to spoil. In fact, it would even get better uh, over time. So that was kind of the wine of choice for uh, early days of the United States and for, for George Washington during his presidency. And, and but also he, he loved that, but he also wanted to find out about other wines. And so who was helping him with that? I mean, who helped he him? Had, he had the, the probably the best advice you could get. Uh, it was uh, I, in, in doing this book, I, I learned that there, as I said, there were several presidents who had great interest in wine. And there were three who I kind of separate from the pack as having uh, extraordinary levels of interest. And those were uh, Ronald Reagan, Richard Nixon, and by far number one, Thomas Jefferson, the founding father of American wine. He, uh, as you know, he traveled uh, he, while well, he was an emissary in, in Paris. He traveled all throughout the French wine regions in Italy and Germany. He took copious notes of every uh, chateau that he visited and tasted their wines. He, uh, I found a letter. This is as a, a scholar. I know you would appreciate this when you have this rare find. I, I was talking to this fellow who is the winemaker at one of the major chateaus in France called Chateau Ikim. It's been around for about 250 years. And I told him I was doing this book and about Thomas Jefferson's role. And he said, I have a letter from Thomas Jefferson on my desk. And I said, really, that's interesting. Uh, could I see it? And he was kind enough to make a copy. And it was to your point, Thomas Jefferson was writing to him as the, 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 at that time, the proprietor of Chateau Kim. And he said, our new American president, General Washington is interested in wine. And I think you'd be interested in yours. So please send him 30 dozen bottles. Uh, and while you're at it, send me 10 dozen too. So, <laughs> just to round it out. <laughs> so that was, uh, and that, that was him, Jefferson, advising George Washington. And Jefferson actually advised four or five presidents on their wine choices. He goes, I mean, he, he earns the title beyond just his providing advice. He, he built the first wine cellar in the White House. It, you know, as you know, uh, Washington never lived in the White House. John Adams was the first president in, in the White House. And when Adams was in there, it was still being completed. In fact, Jefferson comes in as the third president and the White House 
is kind of like a, like today we would describe a punch list. There were still things left to be done. And Jefferson says, where's the wine cellar? And they said, there isn't one. So he designed the very first wine cellar in the White House. And it's, it's identical to the one that people can see if they go out to Monticello today. It's a, it's a replica of the one in the White House. Um, but he, and he also kept extensive records of the wines he served in the White House. He even tried to make wine. His, uh, when he left the presidency, he, he teamed up with a, an Italian uh, winemaker named uh, uh, Philippe um, uh, Mazze, whose family to this day, 26 generations into it, still makes wine in Italy. And they, they planted the grapes, but they were never able to harvest grapes of enough quality to make wine. The new book on Monticello has a chapter on Jefferson and wine. <laughs> and yes. Sorry describe all the other things but there's definitely a chapter on that and speaking of Jefferson can you tell the story about the 1787 Bordeaux that sold at auction for uh, a record amount and then something happened yes um well as pe people knew about Jefferson's travels around about France and they knew you know m modern historians and and wine enthusiasts knew about his his taste in wine. And back in the 80s, uh, uh, someone was doing some construction on a, on a chateau in France. They took out a wall and behind the wall, they found several bottles of very old wine and they took them out and they dusted them off. And it turned out it was from Chateau Lafitte, uh, 1787. And those, that was a wine that, that uh, Jefferson had a particular uh, affinity for. And that was the year that he was ordering wine. And on the bottle, it had engraved THJ, that kind of moniker that we associate with Thomas Jefferson. And the wine uh, experts analyzed it and they said, this is Thomas Jefferson's wine. This is an incredible find. So it went on auction in, at Christie's in London. And uh, there was a lot of bidding and Malcolm Forbes, the, the publishing magnate, his son, Kip Forbes, uh, told me the whole story on this. He, he flew over and his father said, you need to buy that bottle because they had a museum in New York. They wanted to put it in the museum. So he, the bidding went up and ended at $155,000 for a single bottle of wine, the, the most expensive bottle. Kip Forbes then took it, put it on the private plane, flew it back to New York. They put it on display in the museum. And I, I, I know that the curators at the Forbes Museum are not nearly as skilled as the ones at the Library of Congress because the curators put too bright of a light on the bottle and it caused the cork to shrink. The cork slipped in the bottle and all the wine spilled out. And Malcolm Forbes, when he saw that, he, he made a great comment. He said, uh, I wish Thomas Jefferson had just drank the damn thing. Uh, but then the, the story even gets more complicated because uh, this source who found these bottles found a couple more and put them up to auction. And David Koch, who was a huge wine collector, bought a couple of the bottles and he was suspicious about their authenticity. So he hired a, a group of former FBI agents to use their forensics to determine if these bottles were, were real or not. And it turned out they discovered that the Thomas Jefferson that was engraved on the side of the bottle had been engraved with an electric tool uh, yeah. and therefore it could not have been authentic. Oh boy. <laughs> oh, well, at least it spilled. <laughs> <laughs> and when you think about that and the Thomas Jefferson and that, and then the history, and that's what's so wonderful about the book, it does weave the history of what was going on at the time. So in about the 1870s, prohibition uh, was coming in. And from what you say in the book, there's physical evidence right on Pennsylvania Avenue. Yes. And I've all passed yes. it and might not have realized it. That's right. Uh, well, as you know, the prohibition, of course, took place from uh, 1920 to 1933. And before that, there was the uh, the temperance movement that was really driven to stop people from consuming alcohol it became very political. Candidates would be asked during debates if they would take the temperance pledge and pledge that they wouldn't serve alcohol if they were elected. And there were leaders in the temperance movement. And um, President Rutherford B. Hayes was kind of a, a, a great story um, of, of, of temperance in the White House. His wife, Lucy Hayes, was, was one of the national leaders in the temperance movement. And he's elected president and they have this very important state dinner coming up. It turns out it, it's the son of the Russian czar, who was a very important relationship to the United States at that time. And the diplomat said, you must serve wine. This would be a diplomatic faux pas if he comes all the way here and you don't serve wine. 
So she made an exception. She said, yes, I will allow wine to be served. So they had this dinner, it was a successful state visit. And after that, she banned all service of alcohol, any wine, anything in the White House and served uh, fruit juice instead. So she was given the name Lemonade Lucy because of her serving the fruit juice in the glasses. And uh, I found a great quote that's in the book about the Secretary of State, even his own team was not happy with it. The Secretary of the State, of State said, uh, he kind of, uh, on a play on words, he said, at the, at the Hayes White House, uh, water flows like champagne. Uh, but the, the monument you mentioned is on Pennsylvania Avenue. It's, and it was, it's uh, right down near, it's across the street from the National Archives, actually. Uh, and it's a small monument to temperance. It says right on the top. But in another irony, for years, the occupant, the main occupant of the building behind it uh, was a wine store. So... <laughs> I think there was a lot going on during yes. the prohibition, even <laughs> at the White House, because they did, I, you mentioned, they did do a little bit then. And then the, uh, the, in the book, you have more about the role of wine in diplomacy. And in fact, another book by the association mentions how that state dinner with the Kennedys led to the Mona Lisa. Yes. Uh, being loaned. And so could you talk about just how that really helped the toast? What the, it was very significant. Sure. Well, you know, you mentioned just on prohibition, which was very interesting because uh, that followed after temperance movement and, and Woodrow Wilson was president uh, when the uh, 18th amendment was passed that the prohibited, the prohibited alcohol, the transportation purchase or sale of alcohol and Congress had to pass legislation to the Volstead Act to implement it. And Woodrow Wilson vetoed that, and then they overrode his veto. So therefore alcohol was banned in America and in the White House. And he had a problem because he had his own wine cellar that he wanted when he left the White House in 1921, he wanted to take with him. So he had to get special regulatory approval to be able to transport this wine down over to that house over on S Street that he moved into after his years in the White House. But um, the, it, it evolved, as you say, in, in, as you know, in American diplomacy, it's become kind of a, a centerpiece uh, to uh, glasses are raised at all diplomatic events. And it's, uh, it, the toast has become an important part of diplomacy. And, and that's a bit of an evolution, by the way, because uh, I did a little research on, on toasts and found it's got, I included a chapter in there, as you probably saw, it's got yeah. a, a bit of a sordid history. It, Toast went, began back with the, in the Roman Empire. Uh, they would have these huge banquets and they would have a, a large vessel filled with wine and people would take a drink of it and then they would pass it to the person next to them and, and wish them good health. But it turned out this was not very good wine. And by the time several dozen people had drank from it, it wasn't any better. So they would, they would take a piece of burnt bread and they would drop it in there to absorb the impurities. And be, they, by doing that, it created that was a piece of toast, and that created the term toasts, and then uh -huh. it evolved. Uh, I also mentioned even more gruesome uh, part of toasting, which is uh, in in Scotland back in the 10th century, when they would fight battles, the successful warriors would come back, and they would have uh, they would drink from the skull of their the enemy that they had killed, and so when you hear somebody today hold up a glass and say skull, that's the the origin of it. But now. Uh, at, at these diplomatic commits, it's much more civilized. It's uh, they're, they're, the toasts are two to three minutes. They are uh, Jimmy Carter actually start, set a tradition, accidentally set a tradition that's followed to this day, and that was he had the president of Mexico there for state dinner, and he right when the meal began, before they'd even poured the wine, President Carter got up with a water glass and went up and made a toast. And then he realized there was no, it wasn't wine, and he went back down. He had them put wine in his glass and he went up and did the toast a second time just to keep it official. But he enjoyed the fact that he got the toast out of the way. He didn't have to worry about it all evening. So he, for the rest of the time he was president and every president since him has now moved the toast to the beginning of the dinner. We should toast to him because today is his birthday, President Carter. So Absolutely. Wonderful. And my part, and I'm gonna show everybody, you have reproductions of the menus and wonderful things with all of the wines that were served at the luncheons and everything. So it's just chock full of so much. And it really gives you a sense of not only what was happening, but the history too. 
So just before we turn it to someone that I know you worked with and uh, with the Library of Congress in our manuscript um, division, Michelle Kral, who will give us a little bit about the collections at the Library of Congress, that form of diplomacy, how would you, just a little bit of advice about how people could use hospitality and wine? Well, it's, you know, it, it's a way that wine is, uh, you can find common interests. And I, I have discovered that here in America, like, like when, when we have a state dinner, like other countries, we want to showcase the, be showcase the best of America. We have the best food we can put, we have the best entertainment, and we want to have the best wine. So we want to showcase American wine. But you also want to pay tribute to your guest. And several presidents were very clever with this. Ronald Reagan was one. He had the, the prime minister of France coming, Jacques Chirac, who had been his friend for many years. And they actually both had an interest in wine. So here comes France, the wine superpower to the White House. And you want to pay tribute, but you also want to showcase American wine. So he found the perfect solution. He found a, a wine that was a joint winemaking venture between Robert Mondavi, great American winemaker, and Philippe de Rothschild, great French winemaker called Opus One. So that night they were, both, they were able to raise their glasses and they were able to toast each other's country's great winemaking because here was this bottle that reflected the work of both. Yes, and the bottle, <laughs> it's in there and Mondavi, it's all in there. And so we wanted to just hear Michelle, uh, who's a historian, uh, Dr. Michelle actually, um, to talk about some of the presidential collections and how they relate to what your book is all about. Michelle? So thank you, Dr. Hayden. The Library of Congress offers unparalleled resources on presidential history. It holds the personal papers of 23 presidents from George Washington to Calvin Coolidge, which are now digitized and available online. In addition, we have numerous manuscript collections representing government officials and other witnesses to presidential administrations. The library also has an amazing collection of photographs, political cartoons, and other visual media. It makes digitized newspapers available through its Chronicling America website and houses a huge collection of serial publications. Other printed materials on the American presidency range from books to broadsides. The presidential papers at the Library of Congress consist of a president's personal papers, and some of the most personal sources are their diaries. James A. Garfield's extensive diaries shed some light on his feelings about wine, and it's hard to imagine a temperance man starting a diary entry with this quote from Othello. From then Congressman Garfield, we also have confirmation that wine was typically not served at state functions at the Rutherford B. Hayes White House, per the temperance philosophy of First Lady Lucy Hayes, often known to history as Lemonade Lucy. As the man who succeeded Hayes as president, Garfield was confronted before he even took office in March 1881 with whether or not to resume serving wine and spirits at the White House. Garfield recorded in his diary that the answer to the wine question could have important political bearings, but that the impertinence of the temperance people truly angered him. As Garfield was fatally shot by an assassin just several months after taking office, the few social events during his brief administration likely made the wine question at state functions a moot one. The personal correspondence in presidential papers can also shed light on a president's relationship with wine before, during, and after his time in office. As Mr. Ryan's book argues so well, perhaps no president did more to advance wine appreciation in the early American Republic than Thomas Jefferson, and his interest in wine is abundantly documented in his papers at the Library of Congress. In this 1790 letter to William Short, then Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson arranged the purchase of French wines for President George Washington, while also ordering a supply for himself at the same time. President Jefferson often corresponded about wines and their procurement with Joseph Yonardi, Spain's charged affair in Washington. In 1803, Jefferson complimented a pale sherry supplied by Yonardi, confessing that, I now drink nothing else and am apprehensive that if I should fail in the means of getting it, it will be a privation which I shall feel sensibly once a day. Jefferson's interest in wines served by American presidents continued into his political retirement as new president James Monroe requested that the former president recommend wines to serve at the White House. 
Jefferson took the opportunity to suggest fine wines that he hoped would entice Americans away from the alcoholic wines of Spain and Portugal. Presidential papers also record how often presidents received gifts, including wine and spirits. In December 1864, Perkins Stern and Company sent two cases of California wine to Abraham Lincoln on behalf of a political appointee in San Francisco. Although Lincoln himself was not a drinker, no doubt this gift of early California wine did not go to waste in wartime Washington. President Theodore Roosevelt also received gifts of wine, including several Hungarian varieties from Marcus Braun of the Hungarian Republican Club in New York. In honor of Roosevelt's birthday in 1907, Braun sent a case of Hungarian red wine that he was assured goes very well with bear meat, an unusual pairing that might have been of interest to a hunter like Roosevelt. Like Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt drank sparingly, however, perhaps an effect of witnessing his brother Elliot's alcoholism. While I don't know if TR ever sampled the Hungarian wines, his papers do reflect an appreciation of champagne and his interest in having particular varieties served at White House functions. Of course, as Mr. Ryan noted, wines served at the White House do not just quench the thirst of the drinkers, but also serve diplomatic purposes. Just months before TR requested that Reinhard Champagne be served at a future state dinner, he hosted Prince Henry of Germany at an elaborate dinner at the White House. Stereographic views in the library's prints and photographs division show the elaborate table settings and the floral decorations for the evening, which Artists for Harper's Weekly captured in an illustration of the evening's toasts. Many state occasions like these were covered in the newspapers and the Washington Times did a particularly thorough job in chronicling aspects of the February 1902 dinner for Prince Henry, including the toasts given, the guest list, the menu, the floral decorations, and the music played. If you have an interest in historical White House events, Chronicling America is an excellent source for reading contemporary media accounts. Bills and receipts in the library's presidential collections also provide evidence of presidential wine purchases, so, such as several invoices for wine imports that came through the Port of Baltimore in 1807 for President Thomas Jefferson. Future President Chester A. Arthur was well known for his excellent taste in food, clothing and entertainment. Abundant receipts in his personal papers for expenses in the 1870s reflect his frequent purchases of wine and champagne, such as the line item for champagne and claret during a May 1874 stay in a Washington DC hotel. While Arthur's papers do not contain similar receipts for his time as president, unfortunately, those for his pre-presidential days suggest preferences in wine purchases, which may have carried over into the White House. Although the 50 bottles of claret purchased by Arthur later in 1874 came at the request of a third party, they are very much in keeping with the other wine and spirit orders by Arthur at that time. President Benjamin Harrison's papers offer suggestions of what wines were served to his party during a trip to the Western United States in 1891. Particularly noticeable on this drink list is that all of the, Cal all of the wines are California varieties, which had come a long way in maturing since the 1859 vintage sent to Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War. Another program for a dinner held in Harrison's honor includes not only an extensive list of wines available at the Hotel Del Monte, but also their 1891 prices, which seem very reasonable today. The papers of Henrietta Nesbitt, the housekeeper at the Franklin D. Roosevelt White House, offers detailed daily and weekly menus of meals served at the White House. Relatively few specify that wines were officially served with meals, although those present at luncheons during World War II for Prime Minister Winston Churchill of Great Britain and Gen General Charles de Gaulle of France seem to have gotten lucky, or maybe not, depending on the wines served, which as Mr. Ryan notes in his book, were not always of the most enjoyable quality as the Roosevelt served light wines from American vineyards, which had suffered during, the during prohibition. A very robust drinker, perhaps Churchill made sure the sherry and champagne at his luncheon were up to his standards. Intimates at the Roosevelt White House, however, may have fared better as FDR was famous for his private cocktail hours and this correspondence between First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt and Mrs. Nesbitt documents that at the very least, 
gin, French vermouth, and wine were stocked at the Roosevelt's homes in Hyde Park, New York. This is just a sample, or a wine tasting, if you will, of the wealth of resources available at the Library of Congress, which shed light on presidential history and wine at the White House. We encourage you to visit the library's website at www.loc.gov to explore for yourself. Cheers. And I'll now turn it back over to you, Dr. Hayden. Thank you, Michelle, for it's great to see the materials about uh, wine and menus from the Library of Congress's collections. And Fred, another part, and you see I, <laughs> you, the, the artifacts that the White House has. Could you yes, talk about that? Because there's an entire section in the book with the beautiful artifacts. Well, that's uh, an amazing collection that the White House has. And what, what, what happened was over the years as America was kind of coming of age, we wanted to show that we were a, a serious world power. So we had the beautiful White House to invite guests to. It was being furnished with spectacular furniture and art and the wines as we've been talking about, but the presidents really, and first ladies, went to great detail to have these incredible wine glasses and decanters uh, and wine buckets to chill the wine. And they're, they're in, piece of them are in the White House collection to this day, but they were some of the most ornate and uh, beautiful pieces you've ever seen. I put one on the cover. At, the cover is kind of a, a composite of different events, but that, that uh, in the middle, you see a decanter uh, and that decanter is uh, from President Madison. And it's uh, still, it's in the White House collection today with the presidential seal and very ornate engraving. So that was a very important part of it. And an interesting thing I, I learned in the process of this book is we hear a lot about White House China. Most presidents in recent history have purchased White House China, at least uh, two-term presidents have. And uh, what we don't hear much about is the glassware. And the, if you go to a, a state dinner at the White House now, and you, you're gonna have beautiful china and silver in front of you and you'll have a glass for the toast that you raise. That glass is from a caterer. The White House doesn't have a glass collection anymore. In fact, the last time any glassware was ordered was with Jackie Kennedy uh, in the early 60s. So I'm hoping that a future president uh, that he or she will decide that the glassware needs to be uh, added to at the White House and they can expand that collection. And you also have sections about the actual wineries. Could you yes. just give a little bit about that? Well, the, the wine evolved, as you mentioned earlier, Carla, it was, it was pretty much, it was Madeira. And then uh, with Thomas Jefferson's influence, it became French wines for the next hundred plus years. Then uh, in the United States, uh, prohibition, as we talked about earlier, took effect. And that, although these wineries were, were starting to think California and New York, with prohibition, most of them were shut down. So that ended American winemaking. And, and in fact, during the war, um, World War II, there was very little wine imported. So America kind of became a cocktail nation. That was the drink of choice because there was really no wine available. But in the, in the, the 50s and then later in the 60s and beyond, wine started to come back. And uh, the Kennedys, I think, um, well, President Kennedy played and, and certainly First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy played a, a huge role in selecting the wines that were served at the White House. And with her emphasis on, on so many beautiful French things, uh, the, the French wines were very, very popular at the White House. But one thing that was interesting where, where pop culture and history align, I discovered that um, as wines were becoming prominent in our movies and in cultural events, uh, President Kennedy was a, a fan of the Ian Fleming novels and James Bond movies. And I discovered that uh, the first for the, the James Bond aficionados watching, they may recall a scene from Dr. No, the first James Bond movie, where he grabbed a bottle of champagne off the table and he was about to use it to hit a guard. And Dr. No very uh, calmly says, that's a Dom Perignon 1955. It would be a pity to break it. So he sets it back down. One month later, if you look at the menu at the White House State Dinner, the champagne that's served is the Dom Perignon 1955. So I think there's a connection there between pop culture and the wines, but it, it became French. And then it, as you've kind of fast forward to today, uh, California wines began coming of age. And you had Lyndon Johnson, when he was president, uh, that California had a what they called the Wine Institute in Washington. And they would provide California wines to the White House so they could be showcased to, at important events um, 
And, uh, and then President, uh, you come on to, to Nixon. Nixon was, as I mentioned earlier, one of the top uh, enthusiasts of wine and he preferred French and German, but he also gave California uh, wines a fair show. But really a turning point, I think, was when Ronald Reagan came, he'd been governor of California when the wine industry in California was taken off. And he put out the marker, we're gonna serve California wines and more broadly, American wines. So today, if you go to the White House, with very few exceptions, the wines that will be uh, that'll be served at important events will be American wines. Although uh, I just had one footnote, President Obama served the only time ever when the premier from China of China was in the United States. He served a Chinese wine uh, out of as a sign of respect. But that's the only time that a, a, a Chinese wine's been served in the White House. Fred, this has been wonderful, <laughs> and, uh, and you can tell I can go on and on uh, <laughs> because I really. Uh, I love the book uh, and I enjoy wine and thank you. So we thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, so many stories and it's more than just a drink. And I also want to give a special uh, thank you to the White House Historical Association uh, headed by Stuart McLaurin and for making this possible and allowing us to do this. And thanks to our audience. And Fred, you said it was OK. I, I've this might I'll not follow your lead, Carla. Light. Yes. Thank you so much. Cheers. Del, we Cheers. join you. And good night, everyone. Thank you.